great thou art. Praise God. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Matthew chapter 28 as we look at Scripture this morning. And as you're turning, uh, we started last Sunday. We uh, announced a, a love offering that will be taken last week, this week, and next for uh, disaster relief efforts that are taking going on here in the state of Georgia. And our uh, Georgia Baptist Convention is, is uh, uh, taking up offerings to help those in need. So uh, on your offering envelope, you're able to uh, put a, a mark on there for love offering going to disaster relief. So I encourage you to do so. Uh, it always speaks volumes when it's our neighbors. And when we have those that we know, family, friends, those places that we can get to in, a, in just an afternoon, uh, when they are the ones who are hurting, we want to go the extra mile to help out. And I've spoken to some in our area who have been able to go and help out uh, and, and be, put boots on the ground and use their hands to help out those in need. So uh, you may not be able to go physically. Uh, but your heart is there, and so you can give to help out those in need. So I want to encourage you to do so. Also, since I'm still giving you time to turn into the book of Matthew, chapter 28, I want to take just a moment to recognize one of our very own staff members who's celebrating a birthday this week. Yeah, uh, Sandy's got a birthday coming up this week, so make sure you, you uh, let her know how much you appreciate her, not just because she's having a birthday, but for all the hard work she does around here with uh, keeping this place in tip-top shape. Yeah, with that stare she's giving me, she's going to let me have it this week, but uh, I feel like she needs to be recognized. Well, there is a, a, a series of movies that came out. I, I think there's a third one coming out soon, but there's a, at least two movies already. Uh, God is Not Dead, and then there was a sequel to it, God is Not Dead 2. Anybody seen the movies? Either one, either first or second. I, I saw both of them. I own a copy of both of them. Uh, I think the first one was probably my favorite of the two, but I enjoyed both of them. Both of them were inspiring and, and challenging. Uh, but in the world we live in, the world thinks God is dead, or that there is no God. Uh, but in the, the series there, God is not dead, one and two, uh, they are there to prove that God is alive and alive and well, and alive in, in our hearts and our lives. Now there's also a, a saying out there that chivalry is dead. Uh, there's a lot of men out there who don't do their, their part to let ladies know how important they are in our lives. I was reading in the paper not long ago about a, a husband and wife. Uh, she had filed for divorce, and they were standing before the, uh, the judge, and the husband was standing there and said, but judge, she has no idea how much I treasure her and, and how respectful I am to her, and I try to be uh, one of chivalry to her. I always open the door for her. And the judge says, well, I have to, to rule in favor of your wife because opening the door at 65 miles an hour does not count for chivalry. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are living in a world where chivalry probably is dead. That's why I like going to Chick-fil-A. Whenever you go, they go out of your way to make sure you feel like you're the most important customer in there, and it's always their pleasure. Well, I like that. I, I wish men had that still. Uh, when I was a youth pastor uh, for 12 years, uh, one of the things that we did every, every year, usually around, a, a, well, I can't remember when we did it, I guess spring is before they got out of school, uh, we would do a, 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 just a, a one-night event where the girls would go to, to one house, and then down the road, the guys are at another house. The girls are getting all prim and proper and dressed up in fancy clothes because teenage girls like doing that. Now, I don't care for doing that, but they do for whatever reason. So we will allow them to put on their makeup and wear this nice evening gown, something that they really wanted to do. Well, in the meantime, the guys are down the road at another house, and they are cooking this fancy three-course, maybe even a five-course meal. And we got men, uh, others in there helping them do this. And uh, uh, the whole time they're doing this, uh, they're preparing to serve the ladies. So after they get the food all ready, uh, the men would, the, the boys, the teenage boys would put on their suits. We, made, we asked them to wear suits if they had it. 
if they did, then a, 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 coat, a, a tie and, and nice dress pants. And then, then we would walk down to the house where the ladies were and escort the, the, the girls, the ladies, to the, the house where the food is prepared. And then these boys, we taught them to pull out the chair for the ladies. They don't do that anymore, do they? I don't even do that anymore. Uh, the, 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 they, would, they would pull out the chair for the ladies, and, and then they would serve them. And then if the, one of the girls ran out of food or, or their drink got, got empty, the boys would jump up and go and serve the girls during that time. Just teaching these teenage boys that, hey, chivalry may be dead in our world, but it doesn't have to be dead in our lives and, and how we treat other people. Well, there's another thing that I want us to look at here today. Discipleship is not dead. At least it doesn't need to be. Unfortunately, it is dead in, in many of our churches. But I think we need to go back to the basic principles and make sure that discipleship is alive and well in our churches. And that's why we're focusing so much last Sunday on the importance of Sunday school, why we cannot let Sunday school die, and it is the lifeblood of the church. We need to put an emphasis and, re and, and put an investment in the Sunday school. And one of those reasons is because discipleship comes in our Sunday school. And so I want us to look at that here today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 28. We're going to begin reading in verse 18. And if you will, out of the respect of the reading of God's Word, if you're physically able, I want to invite you to stand with me here this morning. In Matthew 28, verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Father, we pray you bless your reading of your scripture here this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, you may be following along with the, uh, the, the outline in your bulletin. Uh, I added an, another point to my message since we printed off that, that this morning. So, uh, when we get to point A, and you have that blank there to fill in, that's actually now going to be point B. Because I've got one that trumps that even, and it's found in our scripture here this morning. But the first thing that we see uh, in our, our message today is that we have the command to go. We are told to go. Now, we come and we sit and we do things here, but if all we do is this on Sunday mornings, if all we do is get dressed up in our Sunday best, if all we do is come and sing hymns and, and praise choruses to God, that is not enough. We have the command to go. And that's part of discipleship is that we need to go out and, and make more disciples. So uh, we have that command. And as we're reading here in verse 19, it says, Go ye therefore. So that's now your new point A in your, in your notes. That is not in there, by the way. So you've got you to add this in. Go therefore is now your point A. Okay? Go therefore. That word therefore is an adverb, which means for that reason. Now, you may have heard pastors or preachers say for, for many, many years, when you see the word therefore, you need to stop and see what it's there for. Well, it's therefore the, the, the fact that we need to see what is, is mentioned beforehand. For that reason, what is the reason that Jesus is telling us here in Matthew 28? And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. That is what therefore is there for. That we focus on the fact that Jesus Christ has all power. All power in heaven, all power in earth, and it is at His disposal. And if you are in Christ, if you are a believer, if Christ is living inside of you, then the same power that He possesses, all power of heaven and earth, is now at your disposal. You now have the power of Christ dwelling within you. All power is given unto Him. So therefore, we must go in His power. Go with the power of Christ. This is His command. It is not His plea. It is not His pretty pleas. It is not Him being nice. It is now Him being an authoritative figure saying, Go! You have the command to not sit here and look good. It's now it's your time to go and get dirty. It's time for us to go and tell other people who Jesus Christ is. 
Well, that doesn't sound very easy at all. Well, remember, you go in the power of Christ. You go with His strength. You go with His power. As we go, it says there to go to all nations. That's now your new B, which in your notes is marked A. Your new B is to go to all nations. We go everywhere. Now, I believe it was last Sunday night I, I preached and, and, and shared from Acts 1.8. We're going to do it again here this morning. And I'll try not to, to, to rehash what we talked about last Sunday night. If you weren't here last Sunday night, then you just missed out on a blessing, okay? That just means you need to come this Sunday night so you won't miss out on a blessing. But Acts 1.8 tells us about going to all the nations. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses both to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, I can explain to you how I interpret or how I apply Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost into my personal life and into the life of the church. But that's where you just missed out last Sunday night for not being here. What it tells me, though, is that everywhere that you go, you are to be a witness. And everywhere that you go, you need to go in the name of Jesus Christ. And everywhere that you go, you need to go in the power of Jesus Christ. Because if He is living inside of you, then His power is already pre uh, present there. And so then you need to share His love with others through His power. Go everywhere. Everywhere you go, whether it's work, play, rest, Whatever it is you're going to do on this day, you go in the name of Jesus Christ. You go in the power of Jesus Christ. So we go to all nations. Thirdly, we go without fear. We go without fear. We sang about that very thing here this morning. Brother Dan uh, selected some great songs for us to sing about us going with power and not fear. Verse 20 tells us that I am with you always, even until the end of the world. And folks, we're living in those days. The world is not going to survive much longer. The, 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 every day that we live, every breath that we breathe, we see the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We are living in those last days. We are living in the end times. I fully believe that. If I didn't believe it, I couldn't stand here with authority and preach God's Word. I believe that He could return at this very minute that we are living in the last days. But you know what? I can also preach with authority that Jesus is with us, even until the very end. It doesn't matter what shooting takes place. It doesn't matter what persecution we may face. Jesus is with us to the very end. I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Unfortunately, we live in fear. That's just a, a natural human nature. We live in fear. When, when something doesn't go our way or something doesn't happen the way we want it to, when, when uh, we haven't seen the command for us to go, we automatically, just by human nature, we say, I can't do that. I'm terrified of that. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to begin. And we let the fear begin to take over. And so Scripture tells us how to handle that. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. We've just been reading. We read this in Matthew 28. We read it again in Acts 1.8. Now we're reading it again here in 2 Timothy. We don't have to live in, this, in, in fear. He's given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Folks, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know where to begin. You just got to say, I'm willing to go. Because I know that I'm going to have the power of Jesus Christ in me. I'm going to have the love of Jesus Christ in me. And praise God, I'm going to have the mind of Christ in me. And He will give you the answers. He will tell you what to do. He will give you the words to say. He will tell you where to go. Don't live crippled by your fear. Live in the power of Jesus Christ to go. Going is the first part of discipleship. You cannot be uh, discipled. You cannot be a discipler unless you are going and, and making new disciples. That's called evangelism. 
You may have friends, you may have uh, co-workers, you may have family members, and those are always the hardest ones to reach because they know you more personally than anybody else. They know the, the good, bad, and the ugly in your life. And I, I, was, I was talking to, to Becky here this past week uh, that there was one of my cousins that I wanted to witness to my whole life, basically. And I got to know him on a, on a more personal basis, and, and uh, I was going to spend a week with him, and, and he was the person I prayed for the most. I wanted to see him come to Christ more than anybody else I could think of. And every opportunity that I had, I'd always chicken out. I, I'd, I'd get so far into the conversation, and then I would just let it go. Now, praise God, he's, he finally got saved. But not because of me. Not because of this chicken. He got saved because God heard those prayers and heard the prayers of others and uh, allowed someone else to witness to him and he got saved. I wish it had been me. I wish I had been the one who hadn't cowered and chickened out. But I did. Family and friends and those that we are close to are always the hardest ones. But you know what? We have the power of Christ going in His love, and we have His mind. We can do it. We can do the hard. We can do the impossible. Because to God, all things are possible. So we go through Him to make disciples. And then we see in verse, verses 19 and 20, as we go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So our command as we go is to teach, to teach. We have a command to teach others. The biblical word for that is to make disciples. Make disciples is the, the, what we are actively pursuing, trying to do. As we go out into the world, go out into your world, and your world may not be halfway around the world. Your world may be halfway across town. But your world is where you are making disciples. You are teaching them the Word of God and His desire to have a relationship with them. A disciple is someone who is growing in their relationship with Christ. Unfortunately, most Christians in today's world could care less and have no desire to grow in Christ. They are absolutely content with the way things are. There's no need for me to get out of my comfort zone. There's no need for me to spend any more time in Bible study. There's no need for me to change who I am. I'm going to stay exactly who I am this way because I don't want to be weird or I don't want to be made fun of or I don't want to give up another night or another uh, opportunity for me just to, to do nothing or to go and do what I want to do. We're very content, aren't we? We're not willing to give up anything else for Christ. How sad. How sad it is that the church is not willing to be the bride of Christ. You see, Billy Graham once said that salvation is free, but discipleship costs everything that we have. It's so easy to pray a prayer. It's so easy to say, yes, I need that and want it but then let it sit right there. You know what we call that? You're a baby Christian. You never grew. If all you do is prayed some prayer, got dunked in a tank, you may have legitimately meant it. You may have had a desire to begin a relationship with Christ, but you never cultivated it. You never grew. You're now still in that baby Christian state. But what God wants you to do is to grow up. To go from the milk to the meat. To go from being an infant to a toddler, to a child, to an adolescent, to a young adult, to a mature adult. Our bodies do that. Why can't we do that spiritually? That's what He desires for us to do. I, I wish I had the body of an 18-year-old again, but I'm so glad that I had the mind of a 43-year-old. I'm so glad that my, I, I'm much more mature. Well, I, that may be debatable. I don't know. But I am glad that I am in the process of maturing. I'm glad I'm in the process of learning something new every day. I just wish I could remember everything every day. We are to make disciples. 
It begins with evangelism. He uses the word there to baptize. We go out to baptize. The first thing to make disciples is to share the gospel, to share with someone else that they are a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means every person you ever come in contact with is a sinner. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Because of the fact that we're all sinners, every single one of us deserves to die and spend eternity separated from God. This is the first step in the, the gospel message. We are sinners separated from God. The second step in the gospel message is that Jesus died for you. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for you. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved you, even though you were a sinner, Christ died for you. We read the first part of Romans 6, 23, but let's finish it. For the wages of sin is death, but, praise God, there's that, that transition there, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So while you were a sinner and you were destined for hell, Jesus Christ and His great love for you provided salvation through His blood and His death on the cross. So those are the two first messages of the gospel. You are a sinner and you need Jesus and He died for you. The third element of the gospel truth is that once we know that we are a sinner and that we are in need of a Savior, then it's to surrender your life to Him. So what do you do with this information? What do you do with the fact that you are a, a sinner in need of a Savior? You surrender. Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then over in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is easy. The gospel is simple. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. So surrender your life to Him. How is it that we can't go and share that with other people? How is it that we are so gripped by fear that we don't do it? Folks, it's time we allow the power of Jesus Christ to go through us to share this simple truth with those around us. So we're to baptize and to evangelize. Next, we are to teach. Teach. Meredith and I have the great privilege to, to go and visit the, the Sunday school classes. Uh, I've now been in six classes here at Chestnut Grove, and uh, every one of them I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed. I've enjoyed not only the great teaching that I've heard, but also the wonderful fellowship. I, I can tell that you love one another. I can tell that you are excited about being there. I just wish everybody felt the same way. I wish others would want to come and be a part of your class. At least the six that I've, I've visited so far. But teachers, I want to encourage you here today. Those of you who have the great challenge and responsibility of being a, a Sunday school teacher, it is your job to make disciples. It's my job, my responsibility to make disciples. That, that, that's part of what uh, the, the, the leadership does, is, is we now carry a, a greater weight on our shoulders to go and make disciples. We are teaching the Word of God so that we uh, don't have baby Christians in our church, but we have maturing Christians. Christians. And now we may be on different levels. There may be some who are just now who are teething, some who are just now moving off the milk and into the meat, and some who've been there for a long time. We have different stages and different phases we're going through, but every single one of us, if you're a member of Chestnut Grove Baptist Church, you need to be growing in your relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. That means you need to be involved in the Sunday school class. That means you need to be under the, the authority of the Word of God being taught to you, not just from this pulpit for one hour a week, but it begins 
at 930 in a Sunday school class. And I want to encourage you to find a class where you can get involved. Not only is it my responsibility and our teacher's responsibility, but it's all of our responsibility. If we have the command for us all to go and make disciples, that means every single one of us have the responsibility to go. You know where you can begin with that responsibility? If you're not a teacher and you're not the one who's preparing a lesson each week, you're not the preacher and you're not the one uh, sharing a sermon each week, then you can begin just by grabbing the hand of a friend and say, will you go to Sunday school with me this week? Will you, will you come to church with me this week? You know the best way that I found out to get somebody to say yes to me? Which, by the way, the, the number one reason that people give as to why they have visited a church is because they were asked. It's not because of some fancy program. Not because of something elaborate, something that went out of the way. It was because somebody invited them to their church and they went. That's the number one reason. All you got to do is ask. But you know what? I, I found that sometimes an incentive really helps. I have oftentimes invited people and said, you know what, if you come to church with me, I, I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. I'm not turning down that invitation. You know what? Just, just a, a friend, a family member, if you just encourage them and say, hey, after church, if you come to church with me, we'll, we'll, we'll go out to lunch. Or you can come over to the house and I, we're going to have roast. We're going to have something really nice. And more times than not, maybe just out of a sense of obligation, they're going to come with you. But then once they're here, and once they're in your Sunday school class, or once they're here under the, the authority of the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will begin to convict them, and they'll be drawn to Him. Not only is it our responsibility to go and to make disciples, it's also our responsibility to be discipled. It is our responsibility to make sure that we are growing in Christ. So yes, I am putting a huge responsibility on our teachers. I'm putting a huge responsibility on myself. I'm putting a huge responsibility on all of us to go out and make disciples. But you know what? I'm putting a huge responsibility on each and every one of you to be discipled. To make sure that you are growing in Christ. It's not just on the teachers. It's not just on me. It's also on you. You've got to say, I need my Sunday school class. I need a, a small group Bible study where I can grow in Christ and be changed forever in Him. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, An overseer, which is another name for a pastor, a title for pastor, then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. I hope that every Sunday when I get up here and boldly say, thus saith the Lord, and ask you to open up your Bibles and read along with me, that you are not only inspired by the Word of God, that you're not only challenged to make a decision for Christ, but you're also taught the Word of God. I, I pray hard every, every sermon that I, I prepare that my messages are evangelistic, my messages are uh, uh, challenging, that I challenge you. Maybe that's stepping on your toes. Maybe that's just to be an encourager, whatever it takes. But my messages are also about discipleship, that you are growing in Christ each and every time that we come together. And for all of us, as we go and make disciples, we evangelize, we baptize, we teach, we're also to teach with authority. Let's go back to verse 18 one last time. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Whether you're a Sunday school teacher, a church leader, maybe just somebody who wants to invite somebody to, to the Lord. When you are sharing God's Word and you're making sure that it's not your words, you're going with His authority, with His power. Last Sunday, that word was dunamis. The Greek word is used for power, where we get our English word for dynamite. Explosive. The ability to, to completely alter. When you go in His power, you change lives. Your words, as eloquent as they may be, 
as intelligent as they may sound, your words don't have the power to change anybody. But God's words, they have the power to rock this world. Dunamis, dynamite, to explode. Has He exploded inside of you? Has He changed you? Has He made you new? Remember that gospel message was very simple. You are a sinner and you're separated from God. But Jesus Christ, He came to be your Savior. He died on the cross to take away your sins. Today, if you've never surrendered your life to Him and made Him your Lord, then I want to give you that opportunity. You can make your way down the aisle during our time of invitation. And Brother Jeff and I will be here where we can share with you how you can invite Christ into your life. And you can surrender your life to Him so that you can now become a new disciple in Christ and begin to grow in the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you've already made that decision. But you're not going in the power of Jesus Christ. You're not going and doing what He's called us to do, what He's commanded us to do. But you'd like to receive that power so you can start doing that. You might want to come and pray here at the prayer altar or pray right where you, where you are. You may want to come and pray with one of our staff about how you can receive His power to do His work, do it His way, and so that Jesus Christ can receive all the glory. However, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today. I want you to listen. He may be telling you about your neighbor who needs Christ. Or maybe somebody who's drifted away from church and He wants to use you to, to invite them, to encourage them to get back into church. Maybe He's telling you right now that this is where He wants you to join and become a, a part of the membership of Chestnut Grove Baptist Church. You can worship and serve Him. However He's speaking to you, this is your time to listen, to hear His voice. Do you respond to Him? So as we have our time of invitation, it's time for you to get along with Him and obey His call. Our Heavenly Father, today as we look at the important aspect of discipleship in your church, God, I pray that we continue to invest into the lives of those around us. I pray that we go and share the gospel with those who are lost. I pray that we uh, invest into th those who are Christians and we are actively growing in our faith. So, Father, I pray that you help us. And, Father, for those here today who have never surrendered their life to you, God, I pray that right now you're speaking to them and you're calling them for salvation. And they respond during this time of invitation. And for anyone else who is uh, getting alone with you right now, and however you're speaking to them, Father, I pray that we all listen, we obey during this time of invitation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.